A lot of the slides I'm going to show today are in this little booklet. So it's available on Amazon.com. Just search for AIM High Thorium, and I'll tell the IRS I'm on a book tour. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, let's start with AIM High Global Environmental Problems Mount. We're also running out of water on the planet. We're running out of food. There's hardly any large tuna fish left. We're competing for oil and energy. We want to avoid some of that contention, which is increased by population growth. We have world population growing from six to nine billion people. On the left, you see income measured in GDP per capita and the numbers of children per woman. Those countries with the highest birth rates have the worst poverty. On the left-hand side of the red line, which is about 2.3 births per woman, you see the stable or decreasing populations in countries in the world. On the right, increasing. $7,500 is what I arbitrarily picked as a sort of a modest prosperity line. If we could bring countries to that level of prosperity, we might begin to solve our population problem. Prosperity is related to energy. If we can bring people to about 2,000 kilowatt hours per year of electrical energy, they have a chance at achieving prosperity. Now, of course, prosperity depends upon the rule of law, good government, property rights, education, all the other things, but electric power for heat, light, transportation, uh, safety, and so on is an important, critical element of prosperity today. Developing countries know this. Energy and coal use is growing rapidly in all the developing countries. They want to achieve that level of prosperity, and they're being supported by Peabody Coal. We need energy cheaper than from coal. We have not been able to pass cap and trade, even in the United States, let alone in all the developing countries. China's answer is, we will consider a cap on energy when our emissions per GDP reach the same as the U.S. Copenhagen failed. Nations resist carbon taxes. The answer to this problem is to produce energy cheaper than from coal. If we can provide an energy source cheaper than from coal, all the nations in their own economic self-interest will choose it over coal. Today, people get most of their energy from solar power. The sun fuses hydrogen to helium, releasing energy, falling on the earth, causing rain, growing plants. Those plants decay, are trapped under the earth, and became petroleum, coal, natural gas. We get our energy from the sun, but almost all of it was delivered 200 or 300 million years ago. There's even an older energy source available to us from supernovas. As stars run out of hydrogen, they collapse. A star five billion years ago burned out, collapsed, and exploded all the elements into space. In the collapse were created all of the elements of the periodic table, all the heavy ones, including at the bottom uranium and thorium. That energy that was trapped in those heavy metals is released in a nuclear reactor. What happens in a nuclear reactor, in addition to the fission we're all comfortable with, U-238 absorbs a neutron, decays and makes plutonium, which is a fissile fuel. We breed plutonium today. A third of the power of a nuclear power plant at the end of the fuel cycle comes from plutonium burning, not just uranium fission. We know how to breed today. We can do the same thing with thorium. Exposed to neutrons, it becomes thorium-233, beta decays over a few days to become a fissionable material. The liquid fluoride thorium reactor changes that thorium into uranium for a fuel. Here we have the heat exchanger and the red salt exchanging non-radioactive salt between the exchanger and a, a, a gas turbine. The thorium is a constant feed into the system. The uranium separator on the left is injecting fluorine to filter out the uranium. And there's a waste separator on the upper right. In some sense, the simplest and the most preferred version. But I would like to just mention that there are other configurations that people are looking at. A single fluid reactor has thorium breeding into uranium-233 within the same tank of salt as the U-233 fissions are taking place. In this example, the easy things to remove are the xenon, krypton, and the normal metals. You need advanced chemistry degrees like Kim in order to get rid of the soluble fluorides. Here's another example where you denature all fissile material with U-238 so that it cannot be used for a weapon in any case. 
we not only convert some of the 232 to uranium, but we also convert some of the 238 into uh, plutonium. But it's a highly proliferation resistant <laughs> cycle. Also the opportunity, Weinberg demonstrated in Oak Ridge of just a plain uranium based molten salt reactor, and that might be an early prototype if we ever develop these. They can be run on U-235 or they can be run on U-233. The Fuji project from Japan, I believe, wants to import pure uranium-233 <laughs> into molten salt reactors. The uranium-233 will be manufactured at a central site, perhaps from accelerator-driven uh, systems. The Berkeley project doesn't have fuel at all in the molten salt. The fuel is contained in these billiard ball size pebbles that contain thousands of uh, sand sized grains of uranium oxide or perhaps thorium oxide coated in three layers of ceramic carbides and graphite layers. The fission products are never taken out. They're left within those small sand grains. As the fuel pellets are used up, they're removed. So there's a three or four possible other versions of this. We talk about the Thorium Energy Alliance, but I also want to emphasize the key technology of liquid fuels. Liquid fuels are what make this whole thing possible. And by possible, I mean cheaper than from coal. Molten fluoride salt, you know all about lithium and beryllium fluoride salts. The point of it is that it has a high heat capacity and a high ability to transfer thermal energy into the um, power generation system. That means that it can be compact, and that means that it can be less expensive. Chemical processing can be continuous. The whole thing operates at atmospheric pressure, and it's a room temperature solid. Here's a two-scale picture of enough thorium to run a one gigawatt reactor for a year. This 500 tons would run the whole US for a year. It costs about $300,000 a ton, except today you can probably get it for nothing because the rare earth people would love to get rid of it. The US Geological Survey says about 440,000 tons are available in the US, which is enough. The actinide can be reduced by a factor of perhaps 10 to the fourth compared to a light water reactor because there are so many more neutron absorptions that must take place to make plutonium if you're starting off with thorium-232. It's walk away safe. Reactivity is stable because as the salt heats up, it expands, pushes some of the critical material into the pipes and tubes out of the critical area, and the reaction slows down or stops. If the salt is somehow ruptured onto the floor or into the environment, it becomes slowly a glass-like substance. Comparing this to a light water reactor, fuel is in a fuel rod. And here's a cross-section. Uranium oxide is distorted from the heat, radiation, and fission products that are all trapped within that zirconium alloy rod that must contain the fuel within the reactor and also for centuries longer. These rods must be taken out of the reactor as they begin to swell and distort. Weinberg and crew developed the very first molten salt reactor in the aircraft reactor experiment, a red-hot reactor working model to prove the concept for this reactor, which was never built, called the fireball reactor, big beryllium sphere, about 200 megawatts thermal reactor, only 1.4 meters in diameter. It would heat a heat transfer fluid, which was a mixture of sodium and potassium that would transfer that thermal energy to jet engines. That was the plan. The plan was not implemented. The design of the, of the engine was to allow uh, bombers to continue to circle the USSR without needing to refuel, but they invented finally successfully in-air refueling, and also we developed enough ICBMs that this particular weapon was never really needed. Meanwhile, Rickover learned from Weinberg the pressurized water reactor was probably the most suitable source for a nuclear-powered submarine. Weinberg actually had the patent on the pressurized water reactor. That was successfully done in 11 years from a standing start to uh, running underwater. In that picture of Rickover, you'll notice he's wearing a suit. He was also appointed by Eisenhower to be head of the civilian nuclear program. And in that capacity, after the Adams for Peace speech, he took a design for a naval aircraft carrier power plant and beached it as it said, at Shippingport, Pennsylvania, to make the first US electric power plant. He had a lot of drive, we had momentum, people coming out of the Navy who were trained in the use of this technology, and that really was the momentum that brought us to where we are today, 
which is technology lock-in. We have an industry which knows light water reactors. We have a regulatory agency which knows this technology. Operators, utilities. It's very hard to break away from the pressurized water reactor and boiling water reactors of today. But that's where we are and probably that's the reason we got there. Meanwhile, Weinberg was concerned about global warming and he was concerned about the sources of energy. So he thought of the idea of the thorium blanketed molten salt reactor. In this example, the people are fabricating the graphite core. The experiment succeeded. They developed an alloy that was suitable and impervious to the corrosion of the fission products floating around in the uh, salt. The xenon off-gas system was perfected, xenon being the most voracious neutron absorber of the fission products. It bubbles out and is trapped, and then so on. They ran it on both U-235 and U-233 for 17,000 hours. So there's a second proof of concept that was done back in 69. Now, can this be cheaper than from coal? It is. Here are four independent proposals to build molten salt reactors and their dates. These are first-of-a-kind units. I took the power output, I divided by the cost of the proposed development and research budget, came up with dollars per watt, and inflated them to $2,009. And the median is $1.98. So that's a good start on trying to make energy cheaper than from coal. Conceptually, look at the difference. Here's a big pressurized water reactor being built in Japan. It's a 100-ton crane moving it. Here's a picture of the AP-1000 being built in China. There's the sort of reactor vessel structure in the middle, the containment around it. And if you can see down the left in the white area, there's a little red man. He's about 1.4 meters tall, which is about the same size as the fireball reactor. The scale is just massively different. Cost is proportional to mass. The first approximation. Another advantage that we have today that didn't exist back then is triple reheat Brayton power cycle. The pressurized water reactor can elevate water to a temperature of 400 degrees. Liquid fluoride thorium reactor can get up to maybe 700 degrees. The hotter the output temperature of the reactor, the more efficient the energy conversion system can be. And we can approach 40, 44, maybe even 50 percent efficiency of the conversion of thermal energy to electrical energy that saves money as well. And it reduces the amount of rejected heat, enabling air cooling. Can we undersell coal? The MIT report says capital cost for coal plants new today is about $2.40 a watt. I said, okay, at 40 years, 8% cost of capital allocated over a kilowatt hours in 40 years. That's about 2.4 cents a kilowatt hour. I threw in a penny for ops and maintenance. Coal costs about $40 in the, a ton in the U.S. today. If you convert to BTU and efficiency, you know, that's about two cents a kilowatt hour just for the coal fuel. So this says electricity is about five cents a kilowatt hour. In the lifter case, we're looking at a little less capital cost than a coal plant. The cost recovery then two cents a kilowatt hour. The fuel cost being negligible or a total cost of about three cents a kilowatt hour. So yes, lifter can undersell coal. So I say, aim high, develop a small modular reactor in the $200 million range that's affordable to developing nations. We can use single modules for isolated cities in Africa or some such place. We can use in the US multi-module systems to replace big coal plants that exist today. Once we get reactors that can be mass produced, we can mimic Boeing. Boeing makes a $200 million item every day. Producing reactors has a lot of the same quality control issues. In the aircraft business, you're worried about strength of materials, corrosion, quality, documentation, regulation, life safety, all those things that we also worry about in building small nuclear reactors. Once you get to mass production, then the learning curve kicks in. And that's an observation, not a theorem. It says that generally when you double the number of units produced, the cost drops by an item called the learning ratio, about 20% generally, about 50% in the IT business. University of Chicago said about 10% in the nuclear power industry. So you can see how the costs drop. By the way, this works counter to the argument for economy of scale. Uh, so I say, okay, do it. Spend five years, develop such a thing. I have a different view of intellectual property. I would like the government to kick in a billion dollars to do this, and I feel if the government kicks it in, they should make it public domain property. Spend another five years and perhaps five billion dollars having the industry develop their technologies to get us to a point where we could actually produce these units. Once we do that, what's the benefit? If we install one a day, 
we can zero out coal emission CO2s in 38 years worldwide. Or we might try to synthesize fuel. We can configure it not to produce electricity, but to dissociate water. And at a high temperature, the efficiency can be as high as 50% from thermal to hydrogen potential chemical energy. You can dissociate it at high temperatures with a couple of catalysts. Here's an example. You can make ammonia out of hydrogen, which can be a fuel. It's also a fertilizer. Ammonia production that consumes more than 1% of the entire world energy budget today. George Ola promotes the idea of substituting methanol for gasoline or dimethyl ether for diesel fuel. You need carbon in order to make these. The Sandia project called Green Energy, they figure we can get carbon out of the atmosphere and manufacture gasoline for about $4 a gallon. Cutting U.S. oil imports, though, is tough. Even if I build one of these a day, it's going to take me 11 years to cut out a billion gallons a year of imports. It's really a tough road to hoe. It's hard to match the energy content of petroleum fuels. We'll always fly airplanes and petroleum fuels. I think uh, you'll find electric cars will help us a lot more. Aim high, cut 10 billion tons a year of CO2 emissions, avoid carbon taxes, improve world prosperity, and also limit population growth, reduce radioactive waste, and consume some of that excess plutonium and so on we can use to start up these reactors. Use inexhaustible thorium fuel. It's available in every nation cutting down the competition for such energy resources. And it's walk away safe. Thank you. That's the that's that's Hey, that worked out great, Robert. Thank you so much, Robert.